The following is a live broadcast of a Lone Star Community Radio program. Recorded and broadcasted live on IRLoneStar.com, Connors FM 104.5, 106.1, and Facebook.com slash IRLoneStar. For more information on this show, please visit our show page at IRLoneStar.com slash shows. To sponsor or donate to this program, visit our donate page at IRLoneStar.com slash donate, or email us at lscrstudios at gmail.com, or give us a call at 936-666-1084. Lone Star Community Radio production and broadcast is possible by folks like you. So sponsor and donate today. You are listening to Lone Star Community Radio on 104.5 KCZW LP Conroe and 106.1 KZCC LP Conroe and worldwide on IRLoneStar.com. Good afternoon and welcome to The Legal Connection with Tony and Cheryl. Tony Lynn Collins and Cheryl Ellsworth Jahani. We are here every Tuesday from 12 to 1 p.m. and we are discussing legal topics. Last, uh, uh, two weeks ago, we did, our topic was depositions and we felt like we needed to, you know, go a little bit more in depth on that and answer some, some more of your questions on depositions. And so this is going to be deposition two. Yes, a little primer, and then we're going to recap a little bit what we discussed so that people can see the importance of depositions. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add a few little, you know, spoilers. Um, If you have are asked a question in a deposition, and and we're what basically, and you're going to define it for us what a deposition is, but but basically, it's uh, statements under oath outside of court that can be used in court. If you're asked a question by the opposing counsel um, in a deposition. Uh, because it's, the jury is supposed to be there and it can be used in court, and you, your attorney or you don't object to it, then you've opened the door for that to come out. Your objection is waived. So you've got to be really, really careful to make sure that you've made the proper objections and you're listening to the question because if they come out with something that may be privileged, that maybe a husband and a wife, you know, had said in incompetence or a priest or whatever it may be, uh, your Fifth Amendment right may be breached and you don't and you or your attorney don't properly object to it, you've waived that objection. Yeah. So it's very, very important that you take depositions uh, seriously, and that's why we're going over it today. Right. Okay, well, a deposition in the law of the United States or, exam- or examination for discovery in Canada involves the taking of a sworn out of court that other oral United testi- States. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oral testimony of a witness that may be reduced to written transcript for later use in court or for discovery purposes, what you just said. Mm -hmm. It's an out-of-court statement that can be used in court. And it's sworn, and it is as though the jury is there. So don't get comfortable and just be casually answering questions to the other side because a deposition is a, a, a series of questions that are asked under oath. And if you answer it differently in court, you will be impeached and your credibility will be attacked and, and you, it, your case may be gone. Yeah. So, well, your credibility sure right. will be you gone. You may lose your case or you've lost a significant advantage if you answer a question that you may not have understood and objected to it being not a clear question in a deposition. Then it comes up again in court and you answer differently. Mm-hmm. Deposition is the preferred term in the U.S., federal courts in the majority of the states. Some states also refer to a deposition as an examination before trial, which is interesting. Uh, In almost all cases pending in the United States federal court, depositions are carried out under Rule 30 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Which we're going to go over again in a little while, a Mm -hmm. little bit more information about Rule 30 and Rule 45, which is um, how you subpoena somebody that's a non-party for a deposition in federal court. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's Federal Rule 45. (coughs) Depositions usually take place at the office of the court reporter or in the office of one of the law firms. So they'll say, hey, we're doing depositions over here. They'll notice you and get you to come over to their law firm. And even in this radio station, they offer the opportunity. We talked about that two weeks Mm -hmm. ago. They're set up here. And uh, the great thing about this is they've got uh, this station doing depositions. Is They've got the recording equipment. It's a nice setup. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so if you're like me and you office from your house, which I do because I'm working 24-7, so I'm now at, I get to see my family while I work, then if you don't want to bring people, and typically the deposition for that party is done at that office, if I don't want to bring people over to my house, the opposing counsel <laughs> and, and all of their their, right. their, their client, the people that, that show up for the deposition, um, then I would ask to have it either done at their office, which is not favorable. You don't want your party going into enemy territory. Exactly. Or I could ask that it be done here at this location That's at a neutral right. spe- part, uh, a place. You can also ask that it be done in one of the court um, uh, like side rooms or jury rooms if it's available because your judge is available if you have to get a judge to make a ruling but um, I've not only done that a few times um, I don't want to bug the, the uh, spiritual, right, right now during COVID I don't want to bug the courts they've got limited space anyway so this isn't a nice place to do it and you know you mentioned COVID a lot of depositions now are taking place via Zoom mm-hmm. you know and so you don't even have to go somewhere right. they'll just send you a link and then but that's sort of like the debate i don't you know i'm not really uh keen on having depositions by a video or by our zoom or some place where i'm not able to see them in person even if it's videoed because i don't it know what they're looking i don't know, I know. If they've got a cheat sheet that mm-hmm. they're looking at i mm-hmm. want to see what they they're looking at to answer questions right so um, i'm not for that but during these times you can do that yes okay so um Let's see. Prior to taking a deposition, the court reporter administers some oath or affirmation, and that's swearing in. That's why these are under oath. You're right. administered an oath. And um, I think like we talked about last uh, uh, session, um, I had done a t- what, 2004 exam, which is Federal Bankruptcy Rule 2004, and the... Uh, we actually did it with a notary that swore in the parties, and we recorded it on the phone. So it oh, right. a court reporter doesn't necessarily have to be there as long as you're sworn in and you can get it recorded, and everybody agrees to that method. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Attorneys for the deposing litigant, that means the person taking the deposition. Mm-hmm. Like, Tony, I'm deposing you, so you're on the other side, right. and you are the deponent. Right. Okay. Um, Attorney who has ordered the deposition begins questioning of the deponent. This is referred to as direct examination, or direct for short. Nods, since nods and gestures cannot be recorded, the witness is often instructed to answer questions aloud. After direct examination, the other attorneys in attendance have an opportunity to cross. So if I'm deposing you after my direct to you, then your attorneys have an oppor- uh, an opportunity to clear cross. things up, and mm-hmm. I will just say that I, you rarely will cross somebody on a deposition. You will save that surprise for for a trial. I mean, you only have so many hours under the rules to depose somebody. Seven. And why would you be giving more information, even if it's contrary? You've opened the door up. And so I would say 95% of the time, the, uh, the side that's being deposed, their attorney given the opportunity to clear things up, May clear up the def- if it's a question that they didn't object to properly or need to um, uh, make sure that it's clear uh, for court. They for may the transcript. They may clarify it, but so the jury can read this even and understand. That, I've not seen it. Even if there's some question, I mean, if there's if uh, and we'll get into this a little bit more later. But if the uh, the person that's being deposed is asked a question that that they or their attorney believes is has a privilege or is not clear, um, then they can say they can ask that. They can direct their their client not to answer the question, and later the side that's asked it, which is all up, you know, you get really crazy in depositions sometimes, as you know. Mm-hmm. The other side is mad because you want to answer the questions. Then um, they can move to compel. They can actually have a hearing later and compel them to answer it if they haven't. But that's how you you can't not answer any questions because that's just not the proper protocol. But if there's some questions they're asking you that are completely are not relevant, and are they're asked in a way that um, that maybe it is relevant, but the, there's it's a multiple, you know, there's a Layered. lot of different, there, it can, that's not a yes or no question. And normally it's yes or no if it's, um, you know, if, if, if you're the other side and you're an adverse witness, they'll ask you a series of questions that are answered yes or no, and it may not be a yes or no answer. Then a lot of times um, the attorney uh, that, that's 
uh, defending the deposition may say, uh, tell their client not to answer or even ask for a break, which is bad because when they ask for a break, a lot of times the attorney that is, is, is coaching their client on mm-hmm. how to answer it. So that's kind of bad too. But if it's being videoed, that all comes out. That's why I like the video, the videography part of it. Right. Uh, you get to see the whole thing and, mm-hmm. and the, the jury can see too the demeanor of the person and what's really happening. Mm-hmm. That's good, Tony. Okay, so um, during the course of the deposition, we were just saying attorneys may object. There are two types of objections. There's form and, <clears throat> I believe, uh, non-responsive. But uh, it says the first is to assert a privilege and the second is to object to form. So you can object to... And form has layers. There's uh-huh. different types of form. And you have to... If you object to form, the, the, other, the attorney that has asked the question, um, should at that point ask uh, what's wrong. Then ask for an explanation of what that is because there's sub uh, categories of form. And and then if well, they... Well, under form is a, are all of our objections. Relevance, right. asked and answered, harassing the witness, all of mm-hmm. these things. Mm-hmm. But your attorney will know those things. But right. I think, Tony, what you're saying is that in a deposition, the... Uh, standard rules are you can object to form, you can object mm-hmm. to leading, you can object to privilege. Right. That's what this is saying. And then also, there's an objection for non-responsive that um, the, depo- the deposing uh, side would make. Uh, non-responsive means, Tony, I'm deposing you, I'm asking you a question, and you're not answering it. So now I object non-responsive. Right. So it's all on the record. And and I will just cover something that we talked about just briefly a moment ago. Um, Conduct during oral depositions and conferences. An oral deposition must be conducted in the same manner as if the testimony were being conducted in court in trial, because that's basically where you're using it. And the counsel should cooperate with and be very courteous to each other and to the witness, because it may very well show up in front of a jury. So be aware of that. The witness should not be evasive. It should not be unduly delay the examination. Uh, private conferences between the witness and the witness's attorney during the actual taking of the deposition are improper, except for the purpose of determining whether a privilege should be asserted. Private conferences may be held, however, during agreed recesses and adjournments. That's typically when it should be done. Right. If the lawyers and witnesses do not comply with this rule, the court may allow in evidence at the trial statements, objections, discussions, and other occurrences during the oral deposition that reflect upon the credibility of the witness. So if you're misbehaving and the judge sees it, they may let the jury see the shenanigans going on at that deposition. So it's very serious that you don't uh, just try to say, oh, I object, and oh, we need to have a conference, because the judge may say, you know what? After she looks at it, at it, you bring it to the judge's attention. She may say, you know what? This is all coming in because you were behaving improperly, and that's going to be your penalty. So um, the objections to hmm. questions during oral depositions are limited to objection, leading, and objection form. Okay, that's what we were talking about before. Objections, testimony during oral deposition are limited to objection, non-responsive. Okay, so I'm going to say that again. Objections to testimony during the oral deposition are limited to Objection, non-responsive. These objections are waived if not stated as phrased during the deposition. That's very specific. You have three ways you have to specifically say it or it is waived. Right. And they can ask you that in trial and it may not even be relevant, but it comes in because it was said during the deposition. All other objections need not be made or recorded during the oral deposition to be later raised in court. Uh, the objecting party must give a clear and concise explanation of an objection if requested by the party taking the oral deposition. So the other side always should ask for an explanation. Why would you give that up? Or the objection You mean when they say objection form, they say, right. okay, what's your, what's yeah, your what objection? Is it? Right. Relevant. Right. So because if you don't an say, then you waive the ability to find out later what it was, and it's, the objection sticks. Right. All right? Um, argumentative or suggestive objections or explanations waive the objection and may be grounds for terminating the oral deposition are assessing cost or other sanctions. And I know you've been in depositions before because we discussed it, mm-hmm. where the other attorney is just downright insane. Right. They've lost their all the decorum is gone and yes. they think they can bully you exactly. and bully your your client. Mm-hmm. And um, I've never done that, but I've seen it happen and, and they're like they're throwing their microphone down, I'm out of here. Mm-hmm. No, that's sanctionable. They can't because they're mad about your questions, just get mad and get up and leave. Mm-hmm. That costs everybody time and it's judicially inefficient. Mm-hmm. So um and loss of reputation with the court reporter there. I've heard mm-hmm. and the videographer there, they remember 
that attorney who <laughs> made that 16 year old girl yeah. cry and they yeah. remember and they don't like those and these people. are the kind of times when you come you do go to the court don't don't let that go by you go to the court you ask for a hearing that the that these things the the objections be reviewed by the judge and that whether it be sanctions be made or whether the testimony come in over the objection and the demeanor of, of how they really behave, yeah. not how they're acting in front of the jury. Yeah. The officer taking the oral deposition will not rule on the objections, but must record um, them for a ruling by the court. Uh, so you have to actually have to say, um, you, you know, the, the various statements. And um, I object, uh, and this will be a, a ruling for the court uh, at a later time. The officer taking the oral deposition must not fail to record the testimony because an objection has been made. Now, um, what I, we were talking about before was the instructions not to answer. I would love to give instructions not to answer to something I don't want to answer. That happens in debates. Wouldn't that be great if yeah. during the, you know, uh, President Trump and, and, and Biden debates, if you could say, um, I'm just not going to answer that. No. Um, <laughs> instructions, because uh, my attorney told me not to answer uh-huh, it. Uh-huh. You know, if you've got a Fifth Amendment privilege, that's one thing, but you can't just not answer. An attorney may instruct a witness not to answer a question during an oral deposition only if necessary to preserve a privilege comply with the court order or the rules under the state or the federal uh, jurisdiction that you're under uh, protect a witness from abusive questioning that they're asking you about your sex life and, it, and it's a car wreck case I mean something that's ridiculous mm-hmm. or, or one for which any answer would be misleading or secure a ruling or secure a ruling pursuant to paragraph uh, that we just talked about before, the objections. Um, so if you know as the attorney or if you don't have an attorney, which we always advise because you really need somebody to be your your wingman in these yeah. cases because you're, you can't you're know. tense, you've got emotions, and mm-hmm. you just don't know because you want to answer the questions, you want to be sure, honest, sure. but it may not be in your best interest. Right. And you're giving up information that has no relevance whatsoever to the case. And can be used against you. So you really do need to have somebody sitting for you or you want to postpone it or object to the deposition because they're not required. Depositions can be compelled, but they're not required by law because why not just have the testimony at trial? Right. It's the exact same thing. Right. Okay. So an attorney instructing the witness not to answer must give a concise, non-argumentative, non-suggestive, they can't say, they can't be nudge-nudge, giving them the reason they're not going to answer or what they need to say, explanation of the grounds for the instruction if requested by the party who asked the question. Now, if you're not even paying attention and you ask a question and they just object or they say, I'm instructing not to, to answer, and you don't have the wherewithal for your client to say, I want an explanation, then you've waived that explanation. Mm-hmm. They just don't have to answer you. Mm-hmm. So you better step up to the plate and answer. Mm-hmm. Now, the, what we have experienced before was suspending the deposition. Somebody gets mad and they rip off their, you know, like we saw in the, um, what was the Jeffrey, oh, I always forget the guy's name. Um, Epstein, thank you. Oh, where nice. he gets up in the middle, yes, yes. he doesn't want to answer, and we all saw it on the news where they're asking him about yes. his sexual, you know, his, uh, his, deviance, his private and parts. That's what the case was about, <laughs> right? And he wouldn't answer it, so he took the fifth. Took he the just fifth, sat there and smirked, and then he he said, "I'm done here," and just took his. Uh, you can't do that, and so, so uh, unless unless you follow the rules. If the time limitations for a deposition have expired, and sometimes you're just waiting for that time to expire. Or the deposition is being conducted or defended in violation of the rules, a party or witness may suspend the oral deposition for the time necessary to obtain a ruling. So they're going to get up and they're going to obtain a ruling. Well, you can't do that unless you have a reason. You can't get up if you don't like the questions. Uh, but a lot, I've seen it happen because people don't want to answer. And just like with Jeffrey Epstein. Well, what'd they do with him? Because he sure got up and left. Um, I don't think the attorneys that were deposing him for the, the wronged victims uh, if from what I could see, they didn't properly um, ask for the deposition to be continued and get a ruling on it. Yeah, we didn't see or that. Or we part. didn't see it because mm-hmm. maybe they did. But yeah. um, if you don't go back, if you don't, you're fighting. This is war. If you're not fighting for every bit of information to get out and not just be evasive and not come out, just like with with a uh, you know a former Vice President Biden not trying to answer to his um, all those emails found on his son's computer. This is a smear campaign. That's not an answer. That's objection, non-responsive. That's right. Oh, they, this has been you have not denied that these are legitimate that's what people try to do in depositions too so he's not under oath but if he was under oath he wouldn't get away with that and i wish the debates were under oath but they're not so um good faith is required an attorney must not ask a question at an oral deposition 
solely to harass or mislead the witness for any other or for any other improper purpose, which you just want to sometimes in a divorce. You're so mad. You want to find out. Oh, gosh. If, and your client wants you to so badly yeah, to get in there. you know the background and, and you want it to come out that they've got, a, you know, several girlfriends on the side and, you know, they've got several boyfriends on the side. They've got several dogs on the side, whatever it may be. You want this to come out. But, <laughs> but you can't come out if it's not relevant to, um, let's say, you've, you've resolved everything but property issues. It's not relevant to the property issues if the child custody part's already been, you know, settled out in a mediation. So you can't ask those kind of questions, even though you really want to or you get mm-hmm. in trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, you're, you're, you could be, your, your attorney could be, the attorney like us could Deposing be sanctioned. Yeah. And they can also, the court can sanction the party. Uh, sometimes they, it, it doesn't just go to the attorney. Oh, my attorney told me to do this. No, the party will get sanctioned too, and big monetary damages. So you got to be really careful. Mm-hmm. You can't. You're, it's just like the wild west out there. Um, without a without a good faith basis, you can't um, get away with uh, bad behavior. An attorney must not object to a question at an oral deposition. Instruct the witness not to answer a question or to suspend the deposition unless there is a good faith factual and legal basis for doing so at that time. So I just wanted to, I needed to kind of clear that up for our listeners that you can't just be a bully. You can't just, if things aren't going well, I'm going to stop this. You really have to follow the rules because the judge may not only sanction the attorney, but sanction you. And it may show up if it's being videotaped, which I always ask for. Mm-hmm. Uh, it may show up in front of the jury and then they can see what's really going on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay, well, I guess we'll go on to Section 2. In our Section 2, Tony, what are we talking about? Oh, we're talking about federal um, federal, uh, federal depositions, mm-hmm. what rules you go to, um, what uh, just the decorum for the federal. The state and federal are a little different. They have different rules. We're following the federal rules of civil procedure or criminal procedure, depending on whether you have a criminal case, which is right. not very often that you right. have you get criminal depositions. Yeah. Um, uh, are the civil depositions in state and sometimes in criminal. I will say this. With criminal depositions, um, you have to approach the judge to ask for it, whether it be a deposition for a witness because they're out of the country or uh, they were somebody that witnessed a murder and uh, they just they, they don't want to come forward. Or there, there has to be a very good reason to get uh, statements, sworn statements from a witness outside of court in a criminal case because why not just do it at trial mm-hmm. and it's very seldom granted because the judge does not want to harass witnesses um, but sometimes you need it because it could be they're in the federal protection program or you know a state protection you know the witness may be in danger mm-hmm. um, but you don't get the um, it's it's difficult because although you have both parties there you're I, I believe it's your your Sixth Amendment right to confront your witnesses is a little bit different, and they, the judges just don't like it. I, right. I've, I've asked for it before, and they always tell me no. And it, it comes up a lot with um, child uh, sexual assault cases where you really need to talk to the the doctors that examine the kid, or the experts, or CPS, or just the child, so that right. they're not in an environment, but they almost never let you even talk to the kid or anybody, so you've got to wait to trial, and those are really difficult cases when you're falsely accused of something like that, because right. the kid is usually, um, a lot of times it does happen, but being a criminal defense attorney, I see more often than not, it's a false accusation by a, a parent or a grandparent that wants to get custody of the kid, or even during the divorce, and they're making it up, and it, they're really, really difficult to fight because when it, when it becomes criminal, the prosecutors can't take it lightly, so it just goes on forever. It, I know. You know. It's difficult. Anyway, so federal, um, the federal rules, what do you have on that? Anything? Uh, no. <clears throat> I believe you have that okay. stuff. So um, on the federal rules of civil procedure, um, if you go to Rule 30, uh, Rule 30 is the the, the deposition, the, the rules for uh, the, the, the specific rules that you can look at if you need to take a deposition in federal court. And it's a little bit different when most people, not most people, but many attorneys practice primarily either in federal or state, not both. And so that attorney may be well versed in the rules of that jurisdiction. Um, but if you don't know the attorney you're hiring um, is it has specializes in one jurisdiction or the other, and the rules are very different. Right. Um, although they kind of follow the same guideline, they are different. Um, then you may want to be checking up on your attorney. Mm-hmm. So you can go to Rule 30 just mm-hmm. to be safe, mm-hmm. like a car mechanic's fixing your car and you're not sure if you know it's the carburetor, the starter, or whatever. You may want to do a little Google search. Well, go to Federal Rule 30 because it tells you what the rules are, so you can kind of check up on your own attorney if you want to do that. Um, 
Uh, if you don't have an attorney and you've been sued in federal court and you feel that it's critical that because you just can't afford it because attorneys are very, very expensive, um, you feel like you need to get um, a, a statement out of court that can be admissible in court and you've, you don't have enough interrogatories left. They didn't answer them. They were non-responsive. They made ob objections and just didn't answer anything like you see all the time. Then yeah. you can ask for a deposition. And the way you can do it, if you really just, you're, you're kind of lost, but I've seen a lot of people do it. There's a lot of smart people out there. I mean, just going to law school didn't make us any smarter. It just gave us sort of a guidepost on what we needed to do to, and then the experience. But let's just say you don't have that and you don't have the money and, and you're, you didn't quash the deposition or they didn't quash the deposition you asked for, or you need it. Then you can go to the, um, a, the the federal uh, website. It's the United States District Court's website, mm -hmm. and um, they've got uh, interactive forms that you can fill in. Mm -hmm. And I printed one today. And if you look down the list that's available to you, you just go to the federal website and you go to forms, um, and they work beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to it, and I don't know where our camera is today. Let me see. There it is, right there. If you can kind of see this, this is what it looks like. It's an interactive form for a to get a civil uh, deposition. Um, to subpoena a, a witness for a civil deposition, right? You can do it for criminal, too. Now, this is a non-party. Um, well, is this the third party? This is um, it, both ways. They've got the different, the, the forms are set up. So if you really are very, you know, new to this, you can, um, there is a form for deposition. And there's also another form for the, to subpoena the testimony for a deposition for a civil action, which is the one that I just showed. And it literally has got a box, and you can just type it in as you go. It's like one of these federal forms that you fill mm -hmm, out. Mm -hmm. And it, you put in there the courtroom date, where the, where the case is, the number, the time of date you want them to be there. If you've asked them for a deposition date and they won't give it to you, then you fill that in. And then it's up to them. If they don't object, then you're going to have a deposition right where you said it was going to be. And what you do is you can call a court reporter if you can't afford a court reporter, you can get, call a notary. Ask if, as long, if it's really difficult if you don't know what you're doing, but you can do this. Get a notary as long as the statement is sworn. And, it's, and I think the, the Rule 30 may kind of give you a guidepost, or the Google does now too. You get your witness sworn in, and then you can ask them a series of questions. But you've got to get them there first. Right. And to get them there, you can go to the federal um, uh, website, and they've got forms you can fill in. These forms are great because they are also, they have discovery forms. Um, they've got subpoena to testify at a deposition, uh, subpoena to testify at a deposition, and to bring a subpoena to use as to bring documents. To bring documents. There's certain rules you have to comply with. Um, Time if, frames. If you really. want them to bring documents, then you have to be specific, or, or they can say you didn't ask for the right one. And, and you have to, what the documents want, don't you have to notice every party you can't it can't be just between you and the third party well if you're going to subpoena somebody um for a deposition then you need to the other side's going to get your subpoena because right obviously and see that's what i don't understand they're getting it anyway right. but the rules say and i think it adds 10 more days or something mm -hmm. so you can well, notice for, uh, i think for, that's just for banking but but for financial institutions, you have to give 10 days notice before right. you can even get bank records. Mm -hmm. But I can't emphasize this enough in state court. And then if it's also in federal court, if it has to do with a monetary damages issue and somebody owed you money they didn't pay and that you had a um, – if you had a, a lien on it, like a landlord's lien or what have you, and they don't give you their bank records to show that they could have paid, I mean, those are important documents and they're relevant, then you've got to um, get those bank records up front. And so it's up to you. You can't just say, give them to me, they don't give them to you. And they're not admissible unless you can get them um, with a business record affidavit mm -hmm. or the bank representative has to be subpoenaed to come to court to authenticate them they just don't come in because you've got them so it's really really important and bank records are critically important for so many cases particularly in state court for family law for right. divorce cases and right. child support mm -hmm. so i can't emphasize enough that start early and and uh, uh, look make sure that your attorney's doing it right too but but get the bank records and if you're going to subpoena them either the state courts are the same way they've got if you go to the harris county district so clerk site the Montgomery County District Clerk site, very, very good sites. They've got forms and they're interactive. Harris County has got like a library of them available. And you can just cross out the county name to mm -hmm. Montgomery or Waller and fill in what you need. And if you can get it served properly, and you have to look at the rules too to make sure it's served properly, you can get a lot of information that way. And if you don't have their discovery in time for trial because mm -hmm. you've missed the deadline, don't give up. You can still 
subpoena the records, subpoena the um, the representative at the bank or the doctor's office or whoever, and get them to come to court with them. You may have missed your discovery deadline, but that doesn't mean that that as long as you've got a good reason for not having in times, it might have been you know a new COVID. It, it could be that your your uh, estranged spouse is smoking pot, and you've got a new drug test. Uh, you need to get them drug tested. You can do it right there. You can ask. You can tell the judge these are the, the circumstances, and I need to. I want to. Sub- you can actually ask the judge if you got a legitimate ex- uh, reason for it. Um, and I've seen this happen. Um, you can ask the judge to have somebody drug tested right there during trial, and they will stop the trial and have them drug tested. They'll bring somebody. Well, but in. as far as these uh, records are concerned, say like you need the bank records, don't you need X amount of time before you subpoena them? So say like you missed your discovery deadline. Yes. Then That's why I'm saying start early because yeah. you got to get them ten days notice because the other side has to have uh, the number the within that ten day frame to object. they can object and if mm-hmm. you haven't and if you haven't given them the notice and they never had the opportunity to object and even though you got the records now what do you do you can't get them in unless you've got enough time to re subpoena them and re notice it properly then they can come in mm-hmm. and, or else uh, you might be able to get it in through a different way but if you don't give them that ten day deadline then you've you've not complied with the rules and you'll be penalized for it now here's some tips on federal depositions on the rule 30. Um, I just want to add real quickly that um, rule 45 is your subpoena power it tells you what the rules are in federal court to follow to get somebody subpoenaed that's a non-party um, rule 30 is for depositions rule 45 is for subpoenas now um, rule 30 b6 of the federal rules authorizes a party to notice or subpoena a business organization, mm-hmm. governmental agency, or other entity regarding designated topics of examination. This is critical if you're suing a company, and people sue companies all the time. Walmart, Slip and Falls at HEB. Mm-hmm. I haven't sued HEB, but I'm just saying mm-hmm. that um, if you've got uh, uh, Tillman for Titta and all of his you know, litany of restaurants, mm-hmm. um, you've got to sue that corporate entity because they, uh, although a corporation may uh, preserve you know some liability it doesn't exonerate the corporation from bad behavior so you need to get those people in and that goes to their attorneys too there was a a legal case that it it was in the united states supreme court and for the life of me i can't remember the case right off i think it was um, u.s versus logan but um an attorney for a corporation was subpoenaed on a a wrongful um, termination suit and he was the attorney was before the suit even came about was um, telling parties within the corporation, you know, guiding them, giving them legal advice. Well, the person that got fired wanted that attorney who gave that advice to testify because he felt like he was improperly telling the superiors of this person uh, what they could do to get him fired or whatever. For whatever reason, they need the attorney there. And it ended up in Texas. And this doesn't apply to all states, but in Texas. So it was a Texas case. It was Texas Supreme Court. Um, they said that the attorney did not have a privilege that even with the apex doctrine that the attorney because it wasn't an attorney client privilege to the corporation because it occurred outside of the lawsuit um, had to testify and so and they argued to the high heavens that this was completely improper that that their own legal counsel would have to come forward and testify and answer questions without a privilege you've got to answer them right. but they said that it had nothing to do with the suit itself or it was relevant to giving them facts toward the suit and so they made the attorney for the corporation come testify wow. and they it didn't and, and they they object that was one of their points of error on appeal and all the way up to the Texas Supreme Court they said no this doesn't get overturned. This should have come in, and it and it's going to in the future. Attorneys for corporations, um, for on on a limited basis, um, can be deposed. They can't get around it just because they are representative of the corporation. Now, um, <laughs> if you want to uh, get a deposition of a a corporate head. And we were not, I mean, you can't bring Sam Walton in. I think he's dead anyway now, mm-hmm. but you can't right. bring in somebody that's the head just because you're trying to harass the corporation. Right. Right. There has to be, they have to be involved. But a lot of times the head people are involved. Mm-hmm. So you need to bring them in. Or at least they make comments. They can make comments yeah, that yeah. bring you, them in. Even if it's one statement, you can still bring them in. Um, doing so requires the party be noticed or the non party be subpoenaed to designate one or more officers, directors, or managing agents, or designate other persons who consent to testify on its behalf. This can be very useful and productive discovery tool for attorneys familiar with this rule and its comments and its history. Um, 
And so here's some tips on it. You want to read Federal Rule Procedure, uh, uh, Civil Procedure 30 and 26 in its entirety. Know them through and through, so you can get you can get that corporate entity or that that that. Um, uh, I guess head of the company in or the representative, right? Okay, well, this is a question. Say, like, there's this corporation and they've got all these employees, and you want to talk to that employee, mm-hmm. but that employee is not a party to the suit. The corporation is yeah, a but party if they were to a fact the suit. They're coming in. Yeah. So, uh, so they're back when it's, they're coming in, you can depose them. It's when what they try to, to, to get around the corporations. If they're not a fact witness, you're only trying to bring in information somebody, about the you company know, because you think it might uh, uh, heads of corporations are afraid to get anything because depositions are so broad. They may have to say something that is completely not relevant, but it may lead to something relevant and they don't want to disclose it. You know, there's like say trade secrets. It may not be trade secrets, but they may say that and so you can get another hearing on it. But but don't be afraid. You may need that person. They may be a fact witness, and they're going to come in if they're a fact witness. And would, would you uh, depose them or notice them under the 30B-6 uh, because they're an employee of this corporation to get that fact witness, or would mm-hmm. you just subpoena the fact no, witness? No, subpoena the fact witness. Just straight up. It's not up to you to make the objection. It's up to them. Um, the first two, that, that reading those two different uh, civil procedure codes and the federal rules, um, seem obvious to an attorney but consider how many discovery disputes still arise out of the refusal of attorneys to stop making boilerplate discovery objections oh no kidding despite the fact of all the different um amendments um in in the federal rules that have been changed Mm -hmm. recently in the courts Mm -hmm. and in the in the the legislature Mm -hmm. um a thorough knowledge of the extent of text of these two um federal 30 and 26 and their committee comments, read the comments too, and it's all mm-hmm. available on Google mm-hmm. if you just Google it, may help convince the opposing counsel to stop their bad behavior. Um, if not, the magistrate or judge will appreciate the fact that you have read and understand the rules. But judges always appreciate people, people that are well informed. They're not just trying to come in there and say, oh, I'm not represented. I don't know what I'm doing. Judges hate that yeah. because judges are people too, and they know how easy it is now to get it through Google. Right. Now, um, if. Um, uh, if you contemplate taking a Rule 30 deposition, start those discussions early um, during the 26F conference, which is the um, mm-hmm. the, uh, is the initial trial scheduling conference. Mm-hmm. Um, consider whether the discovery plan needs to include a provision for how a deposition will be viewed for purposes of the duration and limitation and the permitted number of discovery depositions. It is better to have the judge provide guidance early in the case. And of course, in, in federal courts, it's very different from state court because you've got a trial conference to set the schedule and you're discussing this up front. So you, you really should know who your witnesses are, whether you're being sued or, or you're the person suing. Because when you discuss it with the federal judge, which is gonna be in person or through Zoom, they're, you're going to get a, make a lot more headway if they trust you and believe that you're you're seriously taking their guidelines and their their rule uh, you know the 26 conference seriously mm-hmm. and you're prepared to talk about who you need to depose and why and for how long and what the judge is going to ask you what do you need to ask it for maybe not in detail but you better know it, it's been so frustrating with all of this covid stuff mm-hmm. and the depositions needed and and all of that stuff and just the the doubt of the efficiency of uh, depositions that's been taken on zoom or when you're not in the and the same party with them, do you think that judges would give extensions just because of? Uh, For the right reasons, judges I have found, particularly federal judges, because they're not elected, they don't have a bias, they're very reasonable, much more so than the elected state officials, which to me, in many cases, have a bias because they've got constituents who have mm-hmm. supported them. And they're in running their campaigns, for election. And they're always rerunning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, now, when um, individuals. T- designated to testify by a party um, or, or when you depose them you can require them to bring documents you really want to take advantage of this because if you didn't get them in your request for production because of their ridiculous objections and you didn't a- they didn't answer your interrogatories because maybe they said it wasn't clear enough they objected too much then then the deposition is very important to get these documents now this is your second bite at the apple and it's if it's recorded the judge can see how you've asked for it and why they're not giving it to you it is always the best practice to conduct discovery well in advance of the deposition to obtain documents to be used in their position so you want to ask for it well in advance and if they mm-hmm. don't give it to you you're asking for it again this is your second bite before you have to do an expensive motion to compel 
ask for it for the deposition. Judge, I asked for it here. I asked for it again. Mm -hmm. I asked for the deposition. And now I want I want sanctions against them for not giving me the very specific information that I know they have in their hiding. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um so you want to ask for an advance and they haven't given it to you. It gives you really a big leg up if you've asked for it before the deposition. But you could ask for it again in these forms that we you can fill out mm -hmm. to for a deuces tecum to get the documents again. Be very specific about how you ask for it because they can say it was too broad or whatever. But, you know, they can make up a bunch of objections for not giving you if you don't know exactly what you're looking for. Are broad enough bank records. I mean, you may not know what you're going to find in them, but you know those bank records are have a treasure trove of information for your trial, mm -hmm. particularly in family court. That's mm -hmm. not necessarily in, in federal, but it could lead well, to Well, in corporate it. law, too. <clears throat> Failing to do so will be, waste valuable time during the deposition. Now... Um, be weird. Failing to do what? Uh, uh, to ask, not ask for documents? The deposition, uh, ask for the documents up front in mm -hmm. a previous discovery request. Mm -hmm. So when there's a lawsuit going, you want to start asking for discovery almost immediately. Mm -hmm. You can't do that in federal court, though. A lot of judges say, do not start the discovery process until we've had our scheduling conference. Right. I don't even want you to go there. Because you may have um, special exceptions. There may be some motions we need to knock out of the way. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want you, We're not even going to go there until you've talked to me first. Mm -hmm. Federal is a little different from state. With state, you go for it immediately. Right. Right away, start getting those out because there's deadlines. And you're moving really fast in state court. Judges like to keep their dockets clean. Mm -hmm. So don't wait and procrastinate because you're going to run out of time in your tro your docket control order to get the discovery you need. And then it's going to be your own fault. The judge is going to be mad at you. Mm -hmm. Now, beware the opponent who pressures you to take a Rule 30 deposition, which I'm, I don't like depositions. I avoid them. I know. Because I will go, I will move to compel uh, before I will, uh, particularly if it's my client being deposed, because I don't want their business out on the public record. Mm -hmm. Because they can follow the depositions and the experts in the public record, and it can be about anything, venereal disease or whatever, things that aren't even relevant to the case. So you don't want your dirty laundry washed down. That's why a lot of people don't like lawsuits. Um, before uh, you've, um, yeah. if an opponent pressures you to take a Rule 30 deposition before you've conducted written discovery, that you feel is necessary, um, the judge may not like it, and they may, if they move to quash the deposition, the judge may say you had an, a you had a more a less invasive, more efficient way to get discovery than a deposition, which is taking away from someone's time. They may be a doctor, they may be an accountant. You're taking away pretty pretty much more than a full day of somebody else's time if they're not a a party to the case, even if they are a party to the case, because now they've got to pay the attorney's fees, they've got to pay the court uh, the and court order. The if we're here, we've got to pay the time for mm -hmm. using this facility fee. So depositions are very expensive, and that's why I kind of avoid them. Mm -hmm. I like deposition on written questions. It doesn't limit you to the number of questions you can ask. Mm -hmm. But I do like it when you're getting near the end of trial, and it should have settled, and you know, people are lying. I really do like depositions near the end, uh, right before a trial, because it may persuade a settlement because you know they're lying, and now they know they've got you on film, you know, dodging questions and looking bad for the jury. Mm -hmm. um, based on experience, this can be a signal that there are facts or witnesses that your opponent is trying to shield or otherwise protect from discovery if you're pressuring a, uh, pressuring a deposition. Um, the louder the protest, the greater the chance that something or someone with an as-yet-undiscovered information is being protected. So, um, so basically... If you're being, um, if you're being, I don't know why that would be, if somebody is pressuring you for a deposition for no reason, something's going on. If you're being pressured for a deposition for no reason because discovery's already been conducted and there's nothing out there, something's going on. So that's always a big red flag. Um, if Well, Tony, um, I was going to ask you, um, because we're running out of time mm -hmm. to wrap this section up. How do depositions usually go? You and I have talked about this before, and, and we've talked about how they, they want to depose people all in one day or uh -huh. all in two days. Uh -huh. So say I've got seven people that I need to depose, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So how would that typically go? Would I notice them for a deposition, and then they turn around and notice my clients, me, my clients for a deposition? And... You know, we've got seven hours per party that we can... Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on which level of discovery that you've designated in your pleadings. You will have different times. If you've got an accelerated case, you have a, a very limited time for depositions. Right. But a more extended, extensive case, you have a certain number of hours. If you've got multiple parties on either side, the judge may grant more hours. So it's all relative. But gen in general, you're going to have about four to six hours per deponent. Right, mm -hmm. right. And so would you do those back-to-back, -back, uh, four hours I'm going to do, you do because Joni, you, and then in the afternoon I'm going to do Fred? Or? Um, only because um, everybody usually it's just more efficient for the attorneys involved to put all of your um, 
the witnesses to be deposed on or near the same day and back to back. But there is no rule on who goes first, mm -hmm. whether you're the plaintiff or the defendant, mm -hmm. or who asks first. Mm -hmm. It's always beneficial to be able to ask the questions first, in my opinion, mm -hmm. because then you know what questions you need to follow up on later or what they're actually going after. So there's some benefits and there's some strategies involved. And without the specific facts, I don't know which mm -hmm. direction um, you, know, you want to go with it. Mm -hmm. But I will say this about compelling a witness. A party may compel a witness to attend an oral de deposition by serving the witness with a subpoena under in state law rule 176 mm -hmm. and it's governed by rule 199 okay so remember those for st state of texas law 176 is is the subpoena rule and 199 is the procedures if the witness is a party are retained by employed or otherwise subject to the control of the party however service of the notice of the oral deposition upon the party's attorney has the same effect as a subpoena for a non-witness so if you if you're if you're subpoenaing somebody's fact witness that works for a corporation and the corporation's already represented then you can serve that subpoena via email just a service to the corporation however if they're a total non-party or they've quit that corporation and they don't work for them anymore so they, they're not they're not under that umbrella then you have to use the rules of access subpoena power and go through the proper process to get them served improper service is an amazing objection a party or a witness may object to the time and place designated for the oral deposition uh, by uh, and get a, a motion of protection they can object to how it was served on them it's an improper service but it, it, importantly for for this segment if you're served properly um, and you don't have time or you weren't they didn't talk to you first about the notice that you get you can move to quash the deposition within three days of receipt of that and automatically the court will um, will quash it there's not even a rule. No it's an absolute. Asked. But it has to be within three days. Don't wait. Follow that, that motion to quash immediately because it will be quashed. And you can do that 100 times. The problem you have is if you're just trying to dodge the deposition, the other side will move to compel it, and the judge will order within a certain amount of time you will be deposed. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if they wait too long outside of the docket control order, the judge won't order it, or generally shouldn't, but sometimes they do. So there's a lot of little rules and kind of games that you play with depositions. I don't like them. I think they're overly expensive for my clients who they usually are. don't have a lot of money. I know. I think that um, if the other side is asking for a deposition in lieu of doing the written discovery first, they're only doing it for harassment hmm. um, because it's running my client's bill up. Right. Uh, uh, unnecessarily. Um, if I need a deposition because I know that uh, I think the, the main reason for getting a deposition is when you have asked for discovery, if I'm asking for it or if they're asking for it from me, mm -hmm. um, if you've been trying to get discovery, but it, they've been invasive, they haven't given you what you wanted, they're, they're doing everything within their power not to give you the one thing that you're looking for, mm -hmm. that one question, then I think you need a deposition. Mm -hmm. And what you do is you can call a court reporter, and sometimes you can save money, like we discussed uh, a few weeks ago. You can get the court reporter to videotape the whole thing. And if you get something good out of it, you can save money by having only that part of it transcribed. Right. So and that's another, because uh, we're dealing with lots of people here listening to our show mm -hmm. that are pro se, mm -hmm. don't have a lot of money, mm -hmm. can't afford an attorney, have and looked at everywhere. And that is much less expensive, I know. Yeah. And they're trying to represent themselves because they just can't afford an attorney. Are we out of time? Is Dick giving us notice? No. No, mm -hmm. not yet. We have five minutes. Okay. We're great. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. So that okay. is now. That's let me talk a little info. bit more about notice, real, real quick, and then I'm going to let you ask me some frequently asked questions and other things. Um, if a notice or subpoena is issued under Rule 30, and again, Rule 30 and um, for uh, the federal rules and Rule 45 are very similar to Rule 176 and 199 in the Texas rules. So be familiar with. That those particular sets of rules, as well as Rule 26, um, if you um, get uh, deposed or if you believe you need to depose somebody. Um, Rule 30 requires the notice or subpoena describe with reasonable particularity the matters of the examination. And that's in the federal rules. They need to say just in general what you're covering. Um, if the topics for examination are not adequately particularized, a court may deny a motion to compel. Um, the deposition, or it may quash the deposition notice. So that's another objection. You haven't told me what you want to talk about, so I'm going to object to it. I've not seen that happen very often, but it can happen if you just say broadly uh, what you just want to depose them. In state court, I don't know that you even have to really say what it's about. I've never seen that. But in federal court, you have to be more specific with particularity. Or, um, and there, as you know, federal court's very formal. I love federal court. I think it's very 
I think it's more refined than the state court rules. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but it's mm -hmm. just, I think it's an easier court system to deal with, mm -hmm. just in general. Mm -hmm. um, it's very predictable. Maybe the way it turns out won't be as predictable, but um, there's just less legislative, you know, um, a, you know, a, a, a controversy because you don't, I, I guess you have less people changing the rules all the time. Um, in addition, a court may limit a Rule 30 notice if it requests the organization to designate one or more deponents to testify on topics that are overly broad, vague, or ambiguous. So you have to be careful when you're doing corporations, and they usually have really expensive corporate attorneys, and usually you are suing a corporation if you're a little guy, and let's say um, CarMax or um, ExxonMobil has done you wrong or you got hurt or something, you, and uh, usually personal injury attorneys will, will know, be very um, uh, up to date, and if you get a good, per like the hammer, a good personal injury attorney, they'll know all of these rules, you don't have anything to worry about. But if it's something small, like small claims court, which is criminal and civil, and you may be representing yourself, well, also know this, in small claims court, you can't, um, you, a corporation has to be represented by an attorney. So if you have a small company you've set up, corporation, um, you can't go in there and say, I'm going to represent my corporation because I was sued under my little, you know, uh, Secretary of State corporation I set up. No, you can't do that. You've got to get an attorney. So um, uh, JP Court's got its own little particular rules about that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. other than that, JP Court's a great, you want to follow the exact same rules in state court, in JP Court, on your own, you don't need an attorney, you can represent yourself, but look at these rules. The judges aren't attorneys necessarily, a lot of them are, mm -hmm. but they will really appreciate you knowing what you're talking about when you go in. Conferring or attempting to confer with the opposing counsel if there is a dispute whether topics are described with reasonable particularity may avoid a hearing. And in JP court, they'll send you to the back room to talk with the opposing counsel on the mm -hmm, other side. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times right before trial because they don't want to have to deal with the trial. Mm -hmm, JP court mm -hmm. trials are, bench trials are pretty normal. Jury trials are unheard of. But I've had jury trials in JP court. Mm -hmm, They're not courts of um, record. So you, if you're going to appeal a, 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 a ruling that was not in your favor in JP court, you're going to start all over again in county court, which is you do have to follow the rules. Um, because it's not a court of record, even if it was sworn, you're going to have witness. You're the only way they, you, can, you can show that they lied under oath in JP court because you don't have a record is if you had a witness that heard them say that. And, and you're, it, it's not hearsay um, if, if certain rules, if you can overcome certain rules. But if it wasn't a court of law and they were under oath, then I, I believe that you can get that in. And that's happened before. People will lie to save their skin all the time in JP right. court or otherwise. Right. Um, case law uh, uh, for Texas uh, states that the duty to represent and prepare Rule 30 um, goes beyond the matters personally known to the designee. Um, uh, uh, let's see. The, uh, the party noticed or the non-party subpoena must prepare the... Uh, the designee to the extent that the information is reasonably available, whether from documents, past employees, or sources. So that basically, you've got to prepare. If you're representing somebody, prepare them for the deposition. And we had a whole long list of topics to prepare. Do you, and we may have a couple of minutes to go over that. Do you have that? Uh, tips and strategies. Yes. This mm -hmm. one. Um, tips to prepare a uh, research the law and keep the theory of the case in mind. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, learn which objections are acceptable. You've covered mm -hmm. that. You know, but have form. your cheat sheet ready. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Be organized. Mm -hmm. uh, strategies for taking a deposition. Do not blindly agree to the usual stipulations. Okay. Our listeners, uh, the usual stipulations, what Tony was talking about, objection form, objection leading, uh, and objection on responsive. And so the usual stipulations are, those are going to be our three, right. right? There's no such thing as a usual stipulation, yeah. though. So, never so you need to, to get clarify, clarity mm -hmm. on what those are. Right, what are the ask. usual? Mm -hmm. Just ask. Mm -hmm. Because that's very broad. I agreed the usual stipulations. I don't think attorneys know what they are. No, they don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in different jurisdictions, they don't. They're different. Right. Mm -hmm. um, follow up. Effective lawyers explore nuances. That's a big part of the deposition is right. the follow up. If something comes up and it's something you didn't even think think was you may be going down a, a rabbit trail you never even knew was going to help win your case mm -hmm. so you're just having a discussion mm -hmm. but you have to beware because it's so casual at that point and if, if it doesn't look like it's something that may hurt or help then you still have to be on your toes whether you're the person being deposed 
are the the attorney and remember your fifth amendment right is critical just like jeffrey epstein you can if you think you're going to get in trouble or not sure you can always you can always object with a privilege uh you know attorney even if you don't really even know just a, a husband wife privilege a uh the clergy privilege uh, mm-hmm. fifth amendment's a big one because there's so many things that you can tr- get in trouble for uh in the law that and of course the fifth amendment is when you in, you have a right not to incriminate, incriminate yourself, yourself so you don't have to answer a question even in a civil deposition mm-hmm win and walk away whether you won act like you won and walk away and i will say this also in preparing for a deposition if you're if you're an attorney um if you're if got somebody that's got a flat rate or they're not really prepared or whatever what you want to do for them and as an attorney i always do this i have a list of questions that align with the documents i'm asking the question about and i have them in order that's how i organize Okay. okay. And then we're getting, um, Dick is saying that we have run okay, out of time. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, we want to thank you for listening. I think we wrapped up depositions. That was really good, Tony. We uh, want you to, you can uh, listen to us, our podcast on uh, Google Play or iTunes tomorrow will be available. And we want to remind you to serve God by serving others. Have a great week. Today's show was recorded and broadcasted live on IRLoneStar.com, Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1, and all rights and ownership are reserved to Lone Star Community Radio. For more information regarding this program and Lone Star Community Radio, visit us online at IRLoneStar.com. Lone Star Community Radio is Montgomery County's community radio station, serving the community with local programming on TV, radio, and online. If you enjoyed today's program, please support us by sponsorship or starting your own show. Contact us today by phone or text at 936-666-1084 or email the station at lscrstudios at gmail.com.